Welcome to No Filter. I'm Mia Friedman. Nothing good happens to you after you turn 40. That's what you think before, you know, you turn 40. Holly Wainwright did quite a lot before 40. She moved to Australia from Manchester, rose through the ranks of celebrity magazines, met her partner and had two kids. But that wasn't the end. No, there was so much more to come. Soon after turning 40, Holly came to work at Mamma Mia, where she embarked on a whole new chapter of her career. She became the host of two podcasts, This Glorious Mess and Mamma Mia Out Loud, was recently named the head of content across Mamma Mia's editorial team, and now Holly has just released her first novel called The Mummy Bloggers. It's a story of three very different women who blog about their lives as mothers, and it's a rollicking good read with loads of social commentary about this very fascinating subculture of women who live their lives all out there in the open. Or do they? I grabbed Holly from where she sits two desks away in the office and dragged her into the tiny yet intimate Mamma Mia podcast studio to talk about all of it. Here's Holly. Holly Wainwright, welcome to No Filter. Thank you, Mia Friedman. Now, a lot of people say your life's over when you hit 40. (laughs) A lot of young people think that. <laughs> when you were younger and you thought about turning 40, what did you think your life would look like beyond that that line? Oh, oh my gosh. I think that I thought it was just this big grey blur. I remember working out when I was young what age I'd be in the year 2000. And I think I was just about to so turn... Did I. I think I'd just turned 30 yeah, then. Same. 29, 30. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, oh, well, I'll be too old to have any fun. That's what I thought too. I thought <laughs> I won't even go out on New Year's yeah. Eve. I was like, oh, you know, that's really, really old. And the funny thing about age is that as you get there and you feel the same, yeah. I mean, maybe a little bit wiser, a little bit more cautious, a little bit more brave, but you feel the same and you're like, why did I think this was awful? Why did I think this was old? I don't, I don't feel old. You came to Mamma Mia when you were 40. I did. So you had it, or the first part of your career change. You'd been in print journalism until then, in magazines. I had. And why did you make the move? I remember really clearly, this is another thing that people say that isn't true, is that a lot of people think that when you have your children, and I know this isn't true for everybody, but that your career becomes less important. But for me, it became more important because I had this thing that if I was going to be working and leaving the house every day, which I wanted to do, let's face it, but I wanted to be doing something that I really wanted to do. It became Mm. more important to me. And what I remember really clearly, there were a tough couple of years when the kids were little and, you know, and I was in magazines. And although I had many wonderful experiences in magazines and did lots of great things and made lots of great friends, it was not an uplifting place to be at the time. Why not? Because sales were dwindling, staffs were shrinking, everybody was just like, why, what are we going to do and how are we going to save this? And also the area of magazines that I'd ended up in for a while was um, was in Celebrity. And gossip mags. Celebrity Gossip Mags, exactly. And although I had times there where I did fantastic things and met interesting people and had a great time, it was beginning for me then to become a bit soul-destroying, like... This is a cliche, and I will apologise to all of my magazine friends who may listen to this, but my I had a daughter, and I remember really clearly, like, I was looking at her, and then I was looking at the things I was doing at work every day. About what kind of stories? Lots and lots of body image. So lots and lots of body image and lots of kind of, you know, Kim Kardashian was pregnant, and we were just trying to think of 25 ways to call her fat, you know, mm. that kind of stuff. Curvy. It, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Flaunts her new curves. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, and that's it's funny you just begin to speak in those kind of clichés and you and you almost become yeah. blind to them. And and in in gossip magazines women are either worryingly thin or flaunting their curves which is a a coded yes. way of saying they're overweight. Exactly. There's no woman who's just okay. No, or that you're just there. You're just being. Yeah. So it began to bother me more. I mean, and I did enjoy it, but I remember really clearly when I was on maternity leave with Matilda, I used to read Mamma Mia all the time. That's the time when lots of women start reading Mamma Mia and it was a real window to the outside world for me. Um, and I remember thinking, I, I want to do that. That's where the exciting stuff is happening now. And I very much wanted to wasn't sure if I could and when I came to Mamma Mia it was a big leap because you know in magazines I had worked my way up I was getting paid nice money and I knew what I was doing but I was at a point where that wasn't enough anymore and I wanted to do something different 
Mm. And so that's when I came to Mamma Mia. And oh my God, the first year, Mia, and I know this is your company, but was just like the most vertical learning curve and very difficult, like very stressful, you know. It's a 24-7 business and it's very, you know. You were pretty quiet that first year, I, I seem to remember. I know. And I also was really intimidated by all the young people. Yeah. You know what's funny about age and confidence, and I don't feel this anymore, but I remember there were all these young people who were like walking around like they knew everything and they were so confident in their opinions and they knew. And I was like, whoa, imagine being that sure of what you think about everything. Because as you get older, you actually become a bit less sure about lots of things. You're more true. shades of grey. But I have found my home here. So you wrote your first novel at how old? 45. The Mummy Bloggers. <laughs> We're surrounded by the Mark Zuckerbergs, the incredibly, you know, young and ambitious and successful guns. We work with a bunch of incredibly talented millennials who are all in their 20s. Things can happen to you after you turn 40. How did this happen? It turns out that they can. And this is what we have to tell the young people, isn't it, Mia? Because they're all to us like, I have to do all these things before I'm 30. I'm like, oh, That's how I always felt. Yeah, yeah, but you know, necessarily. Things will keep happening. It's really interesting. I have wanted to write a book since I was a tiny person, like lots of people who love writing. I was that kid who at school I used to write a notebook. It was like a novel about me and all my friends and we were all going out with different members of Duran Duran. Oh, <laughs> fan fiction. Yeah, exactly. Now it has a name. Yeah. But then it was just me writing lots of passing scenes for That's me. Clever. And every day I'd go to school and my friends would be like, what have you written next? And we'd sit down and they'd be like, how come John Taylor's dumped me today? You know. Oh, wow. So, oh, so, so you struggled. Straight away knew you were into fiction. Well, I straight away knew I liked to write, and yeah. then I knew, and then I wanted to be a journalist. And once I knew what one of those was, and then I, when I actually got there, when I was sort of um, going to college and everything, I realised I wasn't a reporter. Like I'm not a hard nosed reporter. I'm no, just me not. Neither. I got. I remember doing work experience at a local newspaper, and they sent me on a death knock, and I nearly died. Like I was just like, this is actually not what I'd do, you know. And that's how I was ended up in magazines, which were very exciting at the time. What but brought you to Australia? I just came back packing. When Did I, you? Yeah. I worked in a place in London with lots of Aussies and Kiwis and I had a Kiwi boyfriend who didn't come with me. So I was like, I want to go and see where all these people come from. These all like, these hot men. Oh, yeah, exactly. A, all these hot men. I was like, all the men in Manchester, which is where I grew up in North of England. I like these pale, skinny guitar playing. With like, bad teeth. Miserable dudes. And, and then I met these on these like surfers. And I was like, men can have like <laughs> shoulders. And it was very <laughs> exciting for me. Anyway, so I wanted to come and see where all that was happening. And I came backpacking to Australia. Um, I was working at like a backpacking travel magazine in London and I came and I said, I'll write some stories and I'll travel around. And then I just loved it. I landed in Perth, travelled all over the country. When I finally got to Sydney, I was like, this is it now. I'm going to stay. How old were you then? 23. And you've been here ever since? Yeah, I've been here ever since. And so it became my home and I, you know, worked in magazines here too. And then I think for me, writing a book was a big dream and something that I didn't think I would necessarily be able to do. Why? I didn't think I was a good enough writer for a start and I and it seemed like such a big thing. And then I came to work at Mamma Mia and I met lots of women who had written books, you know, and I yeah. was like, this is a thing that can happen. And it suddenly began to become more of a possibility and I started to write again, you know, because I'd been editing in magazines for a long time and I didn't write very much at all. Um, so I began to write again I, and I knew that I loved it. And then I was having all these ideas for things and in the middle of last year, that's when the mummy blogger thing was blowing up in the mainstream media. So, you know, this mummy blogger would be fighting with that one and it would make the Daily Mail. Or they weren't mm. even necessarily fighting, but that's for the way the story was interpreted. And I began to realise that these people were crossing over into celebrity territory. And it was so interesting to me, but I thought, what's a really good story is what is going on behind this. I mean, an imaginary story of what's going on behind this, the pressure to stay that interesting and that current when you've had a real stratospheric rise to um, infamy, as it were. And also, if your life is really getting a bit boring and you're sitting down at the keyboard every day, do you ever think, well, maybe I'll just, you know, make things sound a bit more interesting? And so this plot began to come to me and I told a few people about it and they were like, that's really good. And that's how it came about. How did you get a book deal? Because I didn't know, I know until you came and asked me if you could have six weeks off, which seems like 
as a, from a boss point of view, seemed like a preposterously long amount of time, but from someone who's written a book before, seemed to me a ridiculously short amount of time to actually write a book. How did you actually get the deal? It's funny because I knew that you would be interested in this idea and that you would help me because I knew you would because I've seen you help lots of people. But I also had this thing that I didn't want you to feel like you had to. Like yeah. I feel really, I, I hate to feel like people are doing things out of obligation. It's like if I only invite anyone to anything, I always say like, you don't have to come. <laughs> you know, it's just um, like if it's if it's too hard, don't come. It's just yeah. who I am. And uh, what uh, what actually happened is I was talking to well, two women who have re- who really helped me get this book happening was Monique Bowley, who we used to work with until very recently, who is the person who I told the idea to one mm. day, and she went, "Oh my god, that's the best idea! Just stop telling me about it and go and write it down." And then another former Mamiya employee, Lucy Ormond, because I was telling her about it one day and she said, oh, I know this woman who is a publisher at um, at Allen and Unwin and you guys would get along so well, have coffee. And you did. And I told her about it and she immediately saw that it was a current commercial idea. And so then I wrote a few bits and bobs and then it went from there. So your three characters in this book, you've got Elle, the stylish mama, that's the name of her blog. Yes. Abby, the green diva. And Liesl, the working mum. Yes. Now, they say that every author's first novel is autobiographical. Which of those (laughs) women are you? Well, considering that Elle is like a perfect Pinterest mum with washboard abs. Not me. (laughs) And that Abby is a very principled, um, out there, greeny, crunchy mama. Crunchy mama. Not me. Um, and Liesl is the frazzled working mum who's never getting anything right. I That's think. you. Yeah. <laughs> and so then you've got the idea in your head. How do you then make it into a book? You know, it's really, this is going to be an infuriating answer because the thing is, is, I, you know, we talk about imposter syndrome and, and I have massive imposter syndrome about the idea of calling myself an author. But what is interesting is that when I started writing that book, I knew these women. And that was the most fun for me was writing those characters. And I just um, I absolutely loved it. And it was like they kind of speak through you almost. Like, mm. I know that sounds very, very. The biggest problem for me was more about plot because I felt like I had these women and I knew exactly who they were and what they'd say and where they'd live and, and all those things. But then I was like, what happens? And, you know, I didn't know what happened until I finished the book. So then what happened is I wrote, obviously, a few chapters before I um, when I was working before Christmas and all those things. And then I took six weeks off and I had this very tight deadline. And I treated it like a job. I just wrote every day, all day. And about three weeks, four weeks into that, I went and had a meeting with my publisher, Claire Kingston, who's um, who's lovely. But she'd read the pages I'd written already and she said to me, it's great, it's great, but it's moving too fast and what's going to happen? And I was like, well, it's moving too fast because I write in digital and so I'm trained to be like, don't waste a word. Every sentence has to be action-packed and interesting. And she was like, no, no, no. Like, Ah, so it was a different pace yes, for a book. Yes, That's pace. very true, yeah. which is why I like uh, – it's, lov- it's a lovely luxury to write a book in a way because you yeah. do get time – for description and for nuance and for exploring different ideas and subplots. Exactly. And so she, it was like, we need maybe some chapters where everything doesn't happen, you know, that are yeah. a little bit more. So I learned a lot about pace, which was really interesting. Anyway, after that meeting with her, I went home and I restructured it all and I had all of the book mapped out on um, post-it notes on my bedroom wall and I kept them there for such a long time and just annoyed Brent, my partner, so much. And I just restructured it and slowed it right down, but I didn't Did you have different coloured post-it notes for different characters? Yes, I did. Because the three characters are not only interconnected in their own lives and relationships, but their stories weave in and out of each other's through the book. So you're telling sort of three stories through the book. It's a, I, I really love that device because then y- you get to experience lots of different points of view and, and you always feel like there's a lot happening. But I imagine that was complicated to map out. It was. And then knowing where to drop in the chapters from the other people because there are, then there are kind of some partners who get to have a chapter and stuff and working out where they go. It was really interesting sort of mental puzzle and you really had to be – immersed in it and one of the things that is also difficult for for us who work in the way we do and also I'm sure everybody out there is we're so bombarded with information all the time the hardest thing for me was to let myself just have 
thinking space. You know, we were taught, we we have talked, you've interviewed Caroline Overington, who, oh gosh, by any means, I'm not comparing myself to she, but she said how emptying the dishwasher or making a cup of tea is thinking time for a writer. But I would always listen to podcasts while I'm doing that. You know, I'm so used to cramming yeah. all the information in at all the times. I know that you're the same. Mm. That I, It's very rare that I'm actually just being and I had to let myself do that to have any ideas so what was your being time how did you do that it, there were, it was short because obviously I was on a short deadline but it was little things like I'd walk my daughter to school every morning and then I'd walk back and I um, I live near the beach which you know is a luxury but I will live uh, so I'd walk along the um along the front and I would force myself not to listen to a podcast which is what I wanted to do with every ounce of myself yeah. and I'd be like no have some thoughts about the book think about what's going to happen with Liesl and then you know sometimes they would just drop on you I went to have uh, my eyebrows done one day and I was lying on the bed and I suddenly realized that this is what happens when when um, Abby breaks up with Adrian this is what happens and it just comes to you and then you like can't get off that table fast enough because you need to go and write it and it was it was such fun it was so hard but it was such fun and then the ending I just I kept going up to it and up to it and I was like I don't know what's going to happen because these three bloggers are all nominated for an award and I was like who's going to win and how it's going to be and I knew that the climax would be at an awards ceremony it just kind of came. It's amazing. What research did you do? Because you've never been a mummy blogger, have you? No. You, you've written parenting content yeah. and you host our family podcast, This Glorious Mess, with Andrew Dado, um, which is brilliant. But you've never been a mummy blogger. How is it? Firstly, how would you define a mummy blogger in, in 2017? It's a woman who's writing about her life online, right? That's that's really what a mummy blogger is. And with a specific slant to parenting, these days they are on social media more, even more than the blogs, really, as we know. And I think for me, I was aware through through our work, even though we're not in that world specifically, you know, we deal with influencers a lot. Mummy bloggers are often called influencers yes. now, aren't they? So in the sort of mid 2000s or, uh, you know, the 2010s, they were called mummy bloggers. And was that kind of, I always felt that that was a bit of a patronising term. I, I mean, I was is. often called that I because I was, I had a uterus and I worked online. I was called a mummy blogger for a long time by the Andrew Bolts of this world. Yeah, And a lot of bloggers hate it. And one of the bloggers in my book hates it. I resisted calling the book that for quite a while because I know how women feel, a lot of women feel about that mm. tag. But then I also feel that in the last few years, you know, in Australia, we've got a couple of breakouts, like Constance Hall and, and mm. Sophie Keisha, who no longer likes to refer to herself in that way. But it's She used to be called the young mummy. Yes, but now she's so she goes as Sophie Keisha. But they became really? big influencers by being mummy bloggers to start with and I think in a way it should be a term that's reclaimed because I think that that label was meant to belittle and diminish them but actually the opposite has happened you know Constance Hall has a best-selling book she has a merchandising range that is selling out of shops she has more than a million followers like these are now powerful women so it's it and we know I mean you know better than anyone how much people like to throw rocks at powerful women and that mummy bloggers tag is definitely derogatory has got a derogatory yeah. tone but I think they should reclaim it and then it also became obvious to me as I wrote the book that I was being pedantic by not wanting to call it that because really that's what it's about and I had a couple of girlfriends who I would let read it as it went and one of them said you've just got to call it that because that's what it is up next how mummy bloggers make money but first there's something we want to tell you about. Tell me about Constance Hall. She's the most famous mummy blogger of them all, really. Um, and she's really risen to prominence, what, in the last three, two years? Yes, really only in the last, yeah, in the last two. Which is extraordinary when you look at the fact that she's got a million followers. She's one of those people, she's like YouTube stars. The people who know her and love her know her and love her, but a lot of people don't know her if you're not in that sort of group or that cult. For those who aren't familiar with Constance Hall, can you explain the phenomenon that is Constance Constance and the Queens? Constance Hall is a blogger from Perth and she rose to fame when she wrote a post about having parent sex. She wrote this very funny post. She has four four small children and she was a stay-at-home mum, which was something that she was quite um, militant about, about the um, sort of stigma of of stay-at-home mums. And she wrote this post about parent sex, about how her and her then husband had to have a quickie in the bedroom and that's what parent sex is like. And it went viral. And it went viral. It was shared by Ashton Kutcher and, you know, all kinds of big wigs that that really sent her into the stratosphere. And what she, her... 
shtick, I guess, for want of a better term, is that she's a messy mum, you know, and I don't mean that in a, in a negative way, but that's that's where she stands is like, women, we don't have to be perfect. You know, we her followers are called queens and that's because they say, you know, we're all queens. She has tapped something very profound in a particular tribe of mum who now, you know, you can buy a car sticker and you can be a queen. And she self-published her book, uh, which by all accounts has been an enormous success, much to the frustration of many mainstream publishers. And she's never played the game and she does it her own way and she really annoys a lot of people. She does uh, She does sold out tours and at her yes. tours she has a tattooist who tattoos crowns on crown you. symbols on people who want them. What do you think she's tapped into? Because she's clearly tapped into something for, like incredibly potent. What is it, do you think? I think she has tapped into something very similar to what Mamma Mia tapped into back in the day, and we still do, which is speaking a, an unspoken truth, which is that behind all that perfection that we're on, like modern mothers are under all this pressure to be so perfect and to keep it all together at work and at home. And, you know, I mean, we talk about and write about this a lot and be hot at home and be like a CEO in the boardroom and still be a really hands-on mum. And that most of us are falling apart at the scene. And this is mm. a theme that is so familiar to us. She has tapped into a certain um, type of mother in that world who's just like, you know what? F it. You know, it's fine. Let's own that, you know. Yeah. And I think that that has been really powerful for her. And she's very straight talking. And she kind of just says things that other people aren't saying. And I think that that's what's really built her up. But what's fascinating now is she has become a celebrity. The Daily Mail will cover it when she breaks up with her husband, when she um, you know, moves on with someone else, when she has a line of skirts or whatever. But when I was researching my book, back to that, because obviously Constance is you know, the, the kind of pin-up of Australian mummy bloggers, is the people who can't stand her have formed all these tribes around the internet where they just would form these hate groups. And really? to me, it was insane. And I, in that three months that I was kind of immersed in the in my book world, I spent a lot of time online, obviously, in lots of different mom groups. And it really, it made me feel like I needed a shower. They'd watch for anything she'd post. They'd screenshot it immediately, put it on the, the hate group site and all just attack it like piranhas oh and just... God. And then if you didn't join in, you'd get kicked out. So often the admins on those groups will patrol the group and they'll see if, you, um, if you've if you commented lately. No. And if you haven't, they'll boot you out of the group. So it's like so the, salva the salvaging in The Handmaid's Tale. Yes, it is. And it's also like, um, you know, some South American gang who's like, you must shoot this person to be a member of the gang. It's like that. So these are all... So you kept getting kicked out. So I, you get, I would get kicked out quite often. And then... Um, because I wasn't obviously partaking, but I was there to watch. And then I also looked at lots of American blog. But Tell me about Glennon Doyle Milton. Oh, I'm obsessed. I've become obsessed with her. I know. She is so interesting. So I would bet that um, Glennon Melton does not call herself a mommy blogger anymore, but that is definitely how she began. So she, again, spoken unspoken truth. She was a, a mom of two or three, I think, in the suburbs in America. And on the surface, she had this perfect life. She's beautiful and blonde and Christian, skinny. Very and, Christian, yeah, very godly. And her husband is handsome. And But she started writing about how behind the suburban, you know, um, facade, she had a history of addiction and um, eating disorder and everything was messy and she never felt like she was doing a good job. And it's just, as we know, it's something that women connect with. Honesty. Yeah. And authenticity. Exactly. And she, you know, from there became a really big mummy blogger and the thing that was really fascinating about her because she's also she's a bit Liz Gilbert in her um she's very much about self-help and positivity and you know take control of your life and so she wrote this book called Love Warrior and it was about her and her husband when she found out that her husband was cheating on her and that he had a porn addiction mm. and that he'd been cheating on her for a long time and then she rebuilt their marriage with all this faith and help and she wrote a book about it called Love Warrior about standing by your man. And then on the eve of Love Warrior coming out, she announced that actually they were breaking up. <laughs> Which is very brave because she could have probably it's done very the, authentic. she could have probably done the book tour with, without that. Wow. Um and as it turned out she'd fallen in love with a woman and she is now married to a female soccer star from the from America called Abby Wombach who when she married her in all their pictures which were beautiful, she was wearing this sweatshirt that says Christian mommy blogger's wife. <laughs> you couldn't make you this couldn't stuff make, up. Oh my God, you couldn't make it up. And that was the thing that was so 
I mean, so inspiration came from everywhere. Yeah. But obviously in, in my book, I kind of took all that, turned it up to 11, although to be honest, you didn't have to turn some of it up to 11. Mm. And... Um, and created these characters who are none of those people, but they're kind of inspired by all little bits of these people. What I love about this book so much, um, and our co-host on Mamma Mia Out Loud, Jessie Stevens, articulated this so well, is the social commentary in it. You know, she's only 26, so the whole mummy blogger world is is of not much interest to her. But in the same way that Jane Austen had that social commentary in, in all her books, that's what you do so well in The Mummy Bloggers because it's about this idea of the curated lives that mm. we present in social media. That's just not a mummy blogger phenomenon. That's an everybody phenomenon and what goes on behind the scenes and what the costs are and the toll is of of living this perfect life. I mean, I've got friends who are influencers and, of course, no one's life is as glossy and glamorous as they make it look and the the, the, the strain... In, that that exists in that gap between what your real life is like and if you're portraying it as being somehow perfect or glossy or stylish or glamorous, that's exhausting to maintain that strain. Exactly. You know, to maintain that facade. And that's one of the things I really wanted to um, to tap into in the book is that, you know, from, from the woman who is, make, is trying to make everything look absolutely perfect but actually her life has all kinds of problems in it to ones who are trying to actually make it look rougher around the edges than it actually is because really they're quite wealthy and comfortable. It's it's just fascinating that idea of who you are online and who you are in real life and how close to each other they are. And that's something that all of us can identify with. Yeah. You know, I mean, how much time do any of us not working in the media, just ordinary people spend choosing which selfie of us on our night out to put up or, you know, Think and not wanting to ever be tagged in an unflattering picture, being feeling really anxious about who's following us, who's blocked us. This is now not just an experience that's common to professionals. This is the way that everybody is living. And mm. I mean, you know, so millions of words have been written about what impact that has on our society and our mental health. But I think in particular for women and for parents, it's all it's heightened as well. And I think that as though the book is about bloggers, it's also about that. It's about parenting and marriage and and finding who you really are, you know. I mean, one of my favourite character in it is actually Abby, even though she isn't me. And she's the crunchy mum who moves to the country and she falls in love with a woman and moves to the country because she's just so... It's like she thought for the first 20 years of her life, 30 years of her life, that she was living a certain way and then, and then she just blew it all up because mm. it went wrong. And I kind of love that. That's a bit, I guess, Glenn and Melton, but... When I, um, a few years after I started Mamma Mia, we sort of predicted that the mummy bloggers would really struggle as their kids got older, that mm. first generation of mummy bloggers, because it was fine to post this about being pregnant and this about your baby and this about your toddler and even this about your little preschooler. But suddenly they hit seven, mm. eight, nine, and they've got their own opinions and they're not sure and they don't really want you to be posting that photo. And I was talking to Roxy Jasenko when I interviewed her for No Filter a few months ago and, and I asked her about Pixie and she said, oh, Pixie doesn't like having her photo taken much anymore. So there's a lot less photos. When she was younger, she liked to take pictures a lot more now. You know when they get fun? I was going to say, they become, wait till that happens. Well, all opinionated. She's like, no, we were shooting with Stephen Chi for her bow campaign the other week and she's yeah. like, I don't want to take a picture. There's a time when they're very pliable and then yes. they have their own ideas and their own decisions. And, and I sort of always predicted that that, that was going to be difficult. Are we finding that, that there are mummy bloggers who are struggling with that and that idea of sharenting Definitely. and over sharenting. Or it's like the children disappear from the photos, don't they, when they hit that age and suddenly you have to listen to them. Because to be honest, and, I, and I'm guilty of this myself, I mean, you and I have, have quite different perspectives on this. I do post pictures of my children online because I just think they're adorable. <laughs> I'm just like, they are adorable. Look, at them, look how gorgeous they are. And you're always like, they're not going to thank you for that. And I'm like, okay, well, they can tell me about that later. It's true. But it is very true that then they, they're they going to disappear at a certain point. But the downside of that is that we don't hear as much, do we, about the struggles of parenting in the tween and teen years because suddenly you have to be so cautious about what you say. And that's right. I mean, you'd be a, you'd be a pretty awful parent if your child said, please don't. And you did, you know. But what if that's your livelihood? Exactly. It's a, it's a real issue. So I think what, what you tend to see, what I've tended to see from looking at lots of mommy bloggers and their rise, is that in the early days they'll share everything. 
You know, they'll share everything about everything about their lives, their marriage, their kids, all of those things. And then the cost of that becomes apparent. And mm. um, there's a couple in my book where they feel very differently, Lisa and Mark, about about how much she shares he's like why would you do that why do you let these people in and she thinks she's doing a service but I think that the cost of it all becomes apparent and then they often evolve and suddenly those blogs will turn into a, more of a lifestyle blog mm. or a, and the really successful ones do things now like Mrs Wu, who's one of the original ones now she doesn't blog about um, her real life and parenting and stuff but you can go on a trip to Thailand with Mrs Wu. you can pay money and go on holiday with her you'd like they evolve their offering you know, become experts in this or that, do writing courses, teach you about influencer marketing, whatever it is. Like it's, I think they- Sell merchandise. Yeah, they have to evolve it because you can't any longer just talk about the kids. Well, which brings me to the question of money. Can you get rich being a mummy blogger? Well, I don't think that most people can. I think that most mummy bloggers out there are just, it's like, a, it's almost a hobby. But it is, if you've got something else to give, if you are, I don't know, an illustrator or a writer or whatever, it's a great way to raise your profile and sell your wares. And then there's the breakout few. You know, I mean, Glennon Melton in America is worth millions because she's... Constance. Yes, yeah, she's spun, spun it into books. Constance will be so interesting to see because now she's, you know, she's quite wealthy and she lives in a nice big house in the country. And, you know, how... How does that translate? With, with I mean, it's just so interesting how much your life can change. But I would say that anyone who thinks I'm going to start a blog and get rich, I'm sure. I know that you're not a mummy blogger, but I think anyone who thinks that is probably, you would agree, is quite misguided. How do they make their money? They make their money by partnering with brands. So, I mean, we have a young man in our team whose cat makes more money than him in exactly the same way. Yeah, in that right. basically the bloggers will be, they'll get to a certain point, a certain level of influence. And they say that the mark of when you can start to monetize it can be as, as few as seven thousand but you know you're not going to make very much and we work followers with, we yeah. work with mommy bloggers yeah, we at do me or parenting influencers exactly so you get a certain number of followers and then brands are going to want to partner with you and they will it will be little things like it'll be a nappy brand who wants you to you know feature their products in your instagram posts or their green smoothie or their and again this isn't money that's going to change your life but will they just sometimes send you stuff and say will you photograph it definitely but that's getting they're getting savvier and savvier about that now. I mean, I, you know, our experience of, of that, and I mean, even as a media company, you're much savvier about that now, right? Is that we, you, why would I give you all that for free? So what would a, you know, say a pram company wants a mummy blogger to showcase their pram? What what would they have to give her? They'd have to give her a pram and then ha around how yeah, much money and what would they get? Pram. And Well, how much money depends on how many followers she has. So, you know, the ones who have a lot, a lot of followers are not going to post about your product for less than several thousand dollars. But then obviously there's a sliding scale. And, you know, to people like... Constance Hall don't do a lot of that stuff at all and some people have policies some people have policies where they declare it or they don't people like Zoe Foster Blake who is not a mummy blogger but is an influencer you know sometimes she'll say this is not sponsored I mean we all end up doing that to a point don't we because you want to say when it is and when it isn't I mm. suppose so someone like Constance Hall and Sophie Keisha they're businesses now oh, right yeah. like they have managers and they're agents yeah. and publicists yeah they're business people. They have teams. So, you know, they are going from a base of being called a mummy blogger in a, in a derogatory way, I guess, which may still annoy them, um, to being business women. And then that's how you make that transition. And I think that smart bloggers make that transition. It's what we were saying before about how it stops being about the, um, the details of their life and it starts being more about where they want that to go. And I think if they've got good agents and good people around them, that's easier to do. They might transition into media. They might transition into presenting and TV and, and all of those things. So for people who are thinking, I've got some funny things to say. My kid says some funny things. I wouldn't <laughs> mind earning a few bucks and getting a free pram. I'm going to start a blog. How do they go about yes. it? And is it a good idea? <laughs> Look, I think it's a good idea if you enjoy that. You know, some of us are born for sharing. I mean, and or and are really good at social media. And if you want to turn that into something that it's the thing is, is for very few people, it's an actual job. You know, mm. it's, it's a side hustle it's a or, side a, or hustle. a hobby. Exactly. Yeah. And we and it's not just mummies in inverted commas doing this now. It's the same as that girl at work who goes to the gym every day and she's trying to build a lifestyle brand and then you know it's like everybody's got a side hustle as an influencer these days it seems so you can give it a crack I think that the 
key to it is authenticity if you can be who you are um but i think that you've just got to if you also have to have a thick skin i mean we know that anyone who writes online have to have a thick skin i mean i think it's devastating for the likes of constance hall or whatever to know those hate groups are out there um is awful but if you're going to be out in that world that's what's going to happen <laughs> as we know <laughs> as we know Holly Wainwright, The Mummy Bloggers, Three Women, Three Blogs, So Many Lies. It has the most delicious looking ice cream on the cover with a cherry on top and what could be strawberry topping or perhaps blood. <laughs> or blood. Dripping down it. It's the most glorious cover. Such a fantastic book. Congratulations, my friend. <laughs> Thank you, Mia. Thank you so much. The rose petals have been scattered, the champagne is on ice. The country is firmly divided into Team Lisa or Team Laura. Batch Chat is back and so are Maddie J's apps. Australia's number one Bachelor recap podcast returns this week. Where we ask, where will love take us this year? Who will get the final rose and will someone eat the goddamn cheese platter? For the funniest take on Australia's most loved reality show, subscribe to Batch Chat. It's the podcast that drops every Thursday night straight after the show. You can find it by subscribing to The Binge in iTunes or the Mamma Mia podcast app. Thank you for listening to No Filter. You can buy Holly's book, The Mummy Bloggers, and my book, Work Strife Balance, but buy her book first, at iBooks at apple.co forward slash Mamma Mia or at Booktopia, but it's at apple.co forward slash Mamma Mia iBooks That's where you can also subscribe to all our other shows in one place, so probably that's a better place to go. Or, you know what I'm going to say next, the Mum Me podcast app because it's awesome. And there are so many shows in there, even shows that I didn't realise that we were doing, I find, in the Mum Me podcast app. I also find that the iTunes podcast app can be a little bit buggy and sometimes it crashes, but the Mum Me podcast app never does. I think because it's pink. And if you want to hear more from Holly, I know that my daughter is a particular fan Listen to Mamma Mia Out Loud or This Glorious Mess, which is our podcast. Well, it's a family podcast, but it's not like a parenting perfect Pinterest lunchboxes kind of thing. It's all of Holly and her co-host Andrew Datto's signature, funny, flawed, amusing, bloody hilarious uh, stories. I just love listening to it from the just the banter they have. They're so funny. If you need more more no filter in your life, if you need less filter or more no filter, we have 105 episodes from where this came from. Maybe this is the first episode you've ever found. Maybe you're Holly's mum and you've never listened to ep- uh, no filter before, but you're listening because Holly was on this one. Well, have I got some episodes for you. If you scroll back through, through the feed... You can find my, my uh, conversations with another phenomenal writer and content creator, Deborah Oswald, who created Offspring and is also a brilliant author. I also did a fascinating interview with Antonia Kidman. Now, this is another woman who's really changed her career after the age of 40. Antonia is about the same age as Holly and I. She's got, she might be a little bit younger, she's got six children. She's been a television presenter. She's been a stylist. And now she's um, studying and is going to be a lawyer. She's going to be a family lawyer, uh, which is fascinating. And then, of course, another author um, who used to be in ad sales copywriting and also didn't get her break until she was, I think, in her late 30s, Leanne Moriarty, Big Little Lies, The Husband's Secret, Truly Madly Guilty. It's really interesting how many women really are hitting their stride. Lisa Wilkinson is another one. I interviewed her. She started hosting the Today Show when she was about 45. So there are all these phenomenal women who are really doing kick-ass things of kick-assery after the age of 40. It's pretty inspiring, isn't it? If you want to suggest a guest or just ask me a question or tell me what you did after you turned 40, call the pod phone on 02 899 9386 or flick me an email at podcast at mamamia.com.au. Today's show was produced by someone who isn't 40 and she's done a lot in her 20s. Eliza Ratliff, I I can't imagine what she's going to do in her 40s. She works for the Mamma Mia Women's Network, which I do too. My name is Mia Friedman. You can find me on all over the internet, but follow me on Facebook. I've also got a newsletter, so 
I can't remember how you find that. I'll go to miafriedman.com.au and you can sign up for my newsletter, which I am going to start writing again pretty soon. Until next time, I'll see you on the internet. <laughs>